Okay. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, why don't we get started? So my name is Bernd Stormfels, and I'm pleased to report that the organizers saved the best for last. So I'm very happy to introduce a fantastic speaker from Switzerland. So Catherine Hess-Bellwald um, received her PhD from MIT at age 22. After postdocs in Nice, Toronto, and Stockholm, where she frequently returns, she moved to EPFL in Lausanne, down the road in the early 90s, and there she is a professor of mathematics, also director of a lab. Now, she made fundamental contributions to algebraic topology, in particular homotopy theory and category theory, and in the last couple of years, she uh, turned to uh, applications of topology, in particular in neuroscience and cancer biology. Uh, she has a lab on pretty much the topic here, topology and neuroscience, and that has also interesting industrial connections. She won a lot of uh, awards for both research and teaching, so we'll be absolutely in for a treat. Now, Catherine is very prominent uh, in the public sphere, so I watched her TED Talk last night, and I encourage you to do the same. And in the TED Talk, she's called the Digital Neuroscientist of the Future. So, Catherine, take it from here. Thank you very much, Bernd. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers very much from, for having asked me to, invited me to give this address, having in fact insisted that I come back from Australia in order to give this address. It was a great pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed this week, and I would like to congratulate the organizers on a fantastically organized conference. It's really been wonderful. I hope you all agree with me that it's been just fantastic. In fact, maybe we owe a round of applause to the organizers. So after an introduction from Bernd, I hope I will live up to his expectations. I'm going to take you on a sort of mathematical mystery tour through possible explorations of the very complex networks of neurons that we have in our brains. Of course, you know, we'd, we'd really love to understand how it is that our brains work, how the structure of our brains influences their function, and really just try to have some inkling of what's going on inside here. Now, the thing is, it's incredibly complex. And if you try to understand anything about what's going on, you really have to apply some sort of appropriate dimensionality reduction. You have to simplify things somehow so that you can manage to quantify, at least to a certain extent, what's going on in the brain. What I'm going to do today is take a very particular kind of mathematical filter to apply to this picture and focus on certain kinds of geometric structures that are hiding there in this complex thicket of interconnections among the neurons. Now, this is the very end of a long and intense week. So we are not going to spend a lot of time looking at deep mathematics like this. We're really going to go on an adventure. I would hope I, that by the end of this hour, you will have learned something also about neuroscience and not just focused on mathematics. So in this beautiful visualization done by one of the artists who works for the Blue Brain Project, we see a very little bit of the complexity the immense complexity of the brain. We see some of the, uh, just, these are just some of the neurons that you might see. So these are the nerve cells. These are the cells that are actually communicating signals through the brain. And you see some of their structure. You see, for example, the synapses, the connection points where you're transmitting signal from one neuron to another. But there are a whole lot of the sort of the supporting cast that are missing here, the oligodendrocytes, the astrocytes, the microglia that are there for controlling inflammation and so on, just seeing sort of the basic structure. And even so, and even so, it's much less, uh, it's already more complex than we can really try to deal with. Here we're even seeing many, the density of the cells is much lower than what you would actually see. And even so, you say, my gosh, you know, how can I even begin to try to model something like this. Well, 
what we're going to do, instead of doing what uh, neuroscientists often do, which is to you know, take an actual slice of real brain tissue or look at the brain of an animal in vivo, so under a microscope, uh, instead, we're going to be analyzing a particular digital reconstruction of part of the brain of a rat. So this is the work of the Blue Brain Project, which was founded at the EPFL in 2005 by Henry Markram and has been supported by the Swiss government to the tune of millions per year ever since and has led to the construction, well, first of the reconstruction of part of the brain of a rat, and they moved on to a larger piece of the brain of a rat, and now they're going on to reconstructing the whole neocortex of a mouse. And maybe, maybe, maybe in the distant future, you could actually come up and start modeling part of the human brain as well. So I'm going to start telling you a bit about what this blue brain model is, what goes into its construction, and how one can then apply some of the tools of algebraic topology to try to quantify what you see with the structure and the function of this particular model. So as humans, being rather egocentric, we would love to be able to understand our own brains. The problem with our own brains, however, is that they're big. Our brains are about 1.2 kilos. There are hundreds of billions of neurons, of nerve cells in the brain. And these neurons are connected together by hundreds of trillions of synapses, these connection points from one neuron to another. So really, trying to understand this is really, like, it's an enormous problem. Well, the idea of the blue brain scientist was to say, well, let's start with the rat. Let's be a little less ambitious. Um, it seems like it's very different. It's certainly a lot smaller, two grams as opposed to 1.2 kilos, and three orders of magnitude fewer neurons and synapses. On the other hand, the basic structure of the brain is very similar. If you focus just on the neocortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for higher function, for thinking, you know, for us, and speaking, or just... Uh, voluntary motor movement, sensory processing, that sort of thing, then the structure here is very similar. They're both made up of six different layers. They're distinct layers of different kinds of neurons if you go, go from the surface of the brain towards the inside. And the same kinds of neurons appear in both rats and humans. So it seems like a good starting point. In addition, there's a whole lot more lab data about rat brains than about human brains, for obvious reasons. And so we may as well start with what we have. Now, the idea here is that the motivation for the people in the Blue Brain Project is that even after decades and decades of research by neuroscientists, where they've gone and they've explored and developed all sorts of information about the brain, this, we still know only a very, very small fraction of everything there is to know. And so the idea of the people in the Blue Brain Project, which is admittedly somewhat controversial in the world of computational neuroscience, it was to say, well, let's just integrate what we have, take into, you know, build as, as good a mathematical model as we have, integrate as much you know, high-quality data as we have into this model, and see what emerges from all of this data that's been gathered, and see whether it's a reasonable model. So if we focus on this rat, so in its neocortex, this has roughly 200 million neurons, and as it says, roughly 450 billion synapses. So it's still a very huge data problem, but a little more manageable. And so we want to make something that's biologically as accurate as po possible, taking into account as much biological data as possible. Now, how are we going to do this? As I said, we've got so many hundreds of millions of neurons, hundreds of billions of synapses. If you go down to the molecular level with all of the different neurotransmitters, the whole electrophysiology of it, it's an enormous data problem. So what do you do? Well, it turns out that fortunately, our brains are, and not surprisingly, highly structured and also redundant. There's redundancy in your brain. I mean, you don't have just one neuron that remembers how to compute the fundamental group of the circle, for example. That would be a shame. You go out, you drink too much one Friday evening, and whoops. <laughs> so you have this redundancy that's built into your brain. So what are you going to, so we can exploit that. And in order to both interpolate between data points and extrapolate from the data that we have. So for example, here, this is just an image of tractography showing the, the tracks of white matter in the brain that are, so you can see there's a, some sort of beautiful structure that's hidden behind there. And so you want to exploit this great degree of structure. And then once you know, once you do that, you say, well, I, I don't have to measure everything, thank goodness. It's enough to measure a lot of you know, data points here and there and extrapolate, interpolate in reasonable ways. Now, 
I can't continue any further without teaching a little bit of neurobiology, just so we get some language. You know, we're mathematicians, we like to have definitions, we like to know what the words that we're using actually mean. So let me just give you a little bit of neurobiology. So if we're talking about these basic nerve cells, the neurons that are doing the communication work in your brain, then here's, the, here's a cartoon of what they look like. So the basic structure, these are the cell bodies, which are called the somas. And the incoming signals to the somas come through the dendrites. The dendrites are the fibers that are receiving signals. It turns out there's already processing that's going on in the dendrites themselves, some information processing, some gathering. If you looked at the equations they're writing down, the neuroscientists, they didn't realize that they were actually using the, um, the co-cycle formula. Anyway, they, uh, they have this, integrating this information through the dendrites to the soma, and the soma has this nice, uh, cell wall, cell membrane, and what happens is the potential on the cell membrane increases, increases, till at some point it releases what's called an action potential, so or, or a spike of electricity, which then goes down the axon. So the axon is the output cable, and it goes over here to the, to the dendrite of, a of the next neuron sort of in the chain. Now, every neuron has several thousand incoming so it's receiving information from several thousand neurons. And it's outputting information as well to several thousand neurons. So this is just showing you one particular connection where you see the axon from this guy reaching out to the dendrite of this guy and where they touch, they form what's or form called synapses. So it's not, they don't actually touch, they get extremely close and then there's a signal that's transmitted from the axon of one to the dendrite of the next. So it's really, uh, there's a sense, the flow of information here. And so this one we call the presynaptic cell, and this one we call the postsynaptic cell. This is a little zoom of what's happening actually at the synapses, where you have the bouton, as we call it, on the axon, that's releasing the signal to, to a spine on the dendrite via these neurotransmitters. Now, this whole system is highly stochastic. Just because the membrane potential is starting to increase on the surface of the cell, it might not actually fire. The synapses might not actually release they're neurotransmitters, they release varying quantities of neurotransmitters. So there's lots of, there's an enormous amount of stochasticity, there's a lot of noise in what goes on in the brain. Okay, so that's enough neurobiology for today, just so we get some language out there. So what did they actually build in the blue brain model? They were reconstructing part of the brain of a 14-day-old male rat of a very particular, particular species. So why 14 days? It's because that's when, it's what's called a juvenile rat. It's when the rat opens its eyes for the first time. It hasn't been in too much contact with the rest of the world yet, besides its mother. And um, so it's sort of a very uh, naive piece of brain, if you will. And so what they did was reconstruct part of what's called the somatosensory cortex, which would be roughly here in my brain if I were a rat. We have them too, somatosensory cortices. So what they are for is for sensory processing, touch processing in particular. So you touch something, and the nerves in your fingertips send a signal up the nerve fibers to the thalamus, which is a distribution center in your brain. The thalamus sends a signal further to the, in particular, the somatosensory cortex, where the, they start processing the signal, which is then transmitted further, for example, to the motor cortex to tell me to move my hand away if particularly it's hot, for example. Okay, so this is what that part of a brain is. And not only did they reconstruct sort of the architecture of the thing, like what kind of cells are, how they attached, and so on, but also it's set up so that you can actually simulate activity. So you can simulate the input of a stimulus to the circuit and then see how the, how the signal propagates through the network. And you can do this for both spontaneous and uh, evoked activity. So the spontaneous activity is this. Even when you're asleep, even when you're not, uh, there's no particular input stimulus, your brain the, is always working. The cells are always firing, a little bit of background noise and so on. And the idea is that by not being completely quiescent, your brain is ready to react to incoming stimuli. So it really makes you, you're, you're ready to, to, for any kind of incoming stimulus, how am I gonna react to it? If you were completely quiescent, it'd be harder to get started up. And the evoked activity is when you actually have a specific input stimulus that's coming in and sending a signal throughout the network. So this is what you can do with this blue brain model. So this was published in 
uh, it was actually a whole volume of the journal Cell back in 2015. And so we see in this visualization here is one illustration of what this sort of would look like if you could see it. So it's actually very small. Its diameter is about uh, one millimeter here, and the height is about 1.5 millimeters. And so you see the six different layers of neurons. And as I'll say in a moment, so there are actually roughly 30,000 neurons in the reconstruction they did. Here we see only about 1,000 to give you some idea of what the density would actually be. OK, so let me give you a few details of the reconstruction so you can know what goes into this as parameters for the reconstruction. So about 15 years ago, five little rats, aged 14 days, were sacrificed for the greater cause. And sort of core samples are taken from their brain, slices if you, of their somatosensory cortices and various parameters, biological parameters, layer thicknesses, different types of neurons and so on, were extracted from that. And then once you have those input parameters, then there's the, they're used as input to a particular algorithm, which takes into account the precise shapes of different kinds of neurons and very explicit types of connection probabilities between these, not just sort of, we'll think of these as sort of um, probability densities and we see how they intersect and so on. It's very more precise than that. And then there's certain biologically motivated organizing principles that the neuroscientists have come up after, with de after decades of research that we will not question. <laughs> and then, so what's the output? So this algorithm for reconstruction is highly stochastic. There are probabilistic elements in it. So if you input the same set of parameters, you're not always going to get the same output. You get a range of outputs. And so to take this sort of biological variability into account, they made seven different instantiations for each of the five rats. And then they took a set of input parameters that was sort of average for the five rats and put that to the algorithm and made seven different instantiations of that. So in the end, you have six times seven or 42 of these what we call microcircuits. So each of these has roughly 31,000 neurons. And they're roughly, if you think about them as these neurons as vertices and connections between them as edges, there are 8 million connections. And as you see there, I wrote, they've given composed of roughly 37 million synapses. So the point is this. Why are there more synapses than connections? To have a reliable connection between two neurons, because the synapses are highly stochastic, you need to have, in fact, several touch points, several synapses that link any pair of neurons. Most neurons, if, you, if they're connected, they share anything between 5 and 15 synapses for transmitting the information. So we have 7 of these per rat and 7 average. And then what they did, once they had these reconstructions, was to say, OK, they kept some biological experiments to the side, that they didn't use as input data to the reconstruction. And they validated the model on these other experiments. They did in silico, on the computer, versions of these in vivo and in vitro experiments in order to see whether the, uh, the model they built was actually reasonable. Because, of course, you need to validate it when you've done something like this. And if you're interested, there's a fantastic online resource, the Blue Brain Portal, where you can download all sorts of information about what goes into this reconstruction, the different types of neurons, how they're connected, as well as the adjacency matrices for all of these different circuits. It's all freely available. Okay. Now, in this image here, which is a little hard to see, unfortunately, you see some hint of how incredibly diverse the morphologies of the neurons are. What I'm showing you here are what the different pyramidal cells in the rat brain look like. So the pyramidal cells are the neurons that are called, what is called excitatory. They're like amplifying the signal. They're also, they make up about 80% of the neurons in the brain. The other 20% are what are called inhibitory, that are there like, you know, your parents late on Saturday night that are telling you to turn down the music a bit so you don't bother the neighbors, particularly in, Swiss, in Switzerland where you're supposed to be quiet after 10 p.m. The, uh, the, the inhibitory ones will sort of calm you down. But these are excitatories. And these are going from layer 2 to layer 6 in this way. There are none in layer 1. And you see that they have very, very different shapes. Here we're seeing, in fact, only the dendrites, not the axons. And you see that even just the dendrites, the input fibers of these neurons, have very different shapes. They have this sort of messy part here at the bottom that's sort of, sort of root-like. That's what's called the basal dendrites. Then they have these things that are sticking up toward the surface of the of the uh, brain that are called the apical dendrites, and they see they have these very different shapes. And it's important, very important, to take this kind of diversity into account because 
it's been shown that the function of a neuron is highly dependent on its shape and in very precise detail as well. So it's important really to be very precise about the exact shape of the neurons. And that's what they take into account when they actually make this circuit. So let me just run through the workflow for building the architecture of the microcircuit. So first you need plenty of neurons because you're gonna populate, you need 31,000 neurons to populate your circuit. Now, where are these coming from? Well, it's the work of decades of graduate students, poor graduate students, bending over microscopes and peering into the microscopes and very carefully tracing out the neurons from actual slices of rat brain tissue, for example, and then storing these data as sort of XYZ coordinates that describe these, these neurons. Now, for bigger neurons, it's a little bit easier, and so some neurons are easier to, to extract from the, the slice of tissue and so on. So for some types of neurons, you have many examples like this. For others, you don't have very many. The quality varies a lot and so on. But you need, again, a lot of diversity in real life. So they took the, the, the reconstructions like that done by the graduate students. They were of high enough quality. And then they you know, did some perturbations on them to create a new, bigger population, which they then used to populate the microcircuit. So using information, these input parameters from the five different rats, they figured out like which sort of neurons should be in each layer, what were the densities, and so on. Put them in place, and then reconstructed the connectivity. So their basic conditions on connectivity, that the axon of one neuron has to come within three microns of the dendrite of another for a synapse even to exist. But then if every possible touch like that gave you a synapse, then you would have way too many. You're, you, would, you would have an autistic brain that would just go crazy with uh, too much information, too much firing. So you have to prune away a lot of connections in a very careful way to end up with a distribution of actual synapses in this network that corresponds as closely as we can tell to biology. So after that, you have your architecture in place. But, you know, we don't want just to look at a microcircuit. We want it to work. We want it to function. We want it to behave like a piece of, a real piece of brain. So that's where the physiology comes into play. And then you have to integrate the electrical behavior of the neurons, not just their shapes. And it turns out that even two neurons that are very, have shapes that are very similar can sometimes have electrical behavior that's very different. So what you see here, this little illustration, this little cartoon, is the kind of output you signal you can get from a neuron if you stick an electrode into the soma, into the cell body, and you feed the current into it. And you see how does the neuron react. And it can have very different kinds of reaction patterns, fast spiking, flow spiking, blah, blah, blah. And so you have to take that kind of electrical diversity into account. The synapses as well can be highly diverse, so you have to take that kind of diversity into account. Now this is a whole lot of partial differential equations that are being used to describe this structure, this behavior. Once you have one of these microcircuits, you can glue a bunch of them together and have a piece of virtual brain tissue in which you can input a stimulus and see how the stimulus spreads throughout the circuit. And I'll show you an example of this in a little while. All right, what's it good for? Well, what you hope it's good for is to be able to see what kind of structure and function emerges from the local information we have. So, the decades of work that the neuroscientists have done have really told us a lot about what, what happens locally in the circuit, right? So what happen, how do different types of pairs of neurons connect? Little tiny groups of neurons, how do they behave together? So we know a lot of local information, but we, what we want to know is more global information. And so as an example of this that I really like, it's fairly well known that um, so there's a certain ion that circulates in your cerebrospinal fluid, calcium, calcium ion. And depending on the concentration of this calcium ion, your neurons behave in different ways. When the calcium concentration is very low, there's a lot of sporadic, unorganized, kind of chaotic firing going on. I mean, in a relatively low level of firing as well. When the calcium concentration is very high, you'll have a lot of neurons that are firing, and they're firing together. They're very organized, doom, doom. Doom. Literally, the spiking pattern looks like a bunch of straight lines like this. And then there's a sort of sweet spot in between where you have some of this chaotic firing and some of this highly organized firing. And that is what, that's really the, the sweet spot for being ready 
to accept an input stimulus. You're ready to react to anything, but you're still, you know, you're kind of organized as well. Now, this kind of behavior in reaction to calcium concentration was not built into the reconstruction. This was not part of the algorithm reconstruction. However, it emerged from the local conditions that were taken into account when the reconstruction was done. So this, I think, is quite striking, that you get this kind of global behavior observed in the laboratory that emerges from the way the circuit was built. Also, one door that is just opening now is to be able to use this circuit to do sort of an in silico on the computer study of various kind of neurological disorders, think about how to model different kinds of neuroprostheses, and, and so on. So this is a new tool for the neuroscientists to model neurological disorders, psychiatric diseases, and so on, Alzheimer's, uh, schizophrenia, and so on, to be able to say, okay, well, if we have these kinds of neurons that are misbehaving, how does that affect what the circuit does? So the potential, we hope, is that this can reduce the need for animal testing. So you can, if you say, ah, I think I have a molecule that I can use to treat this particular psychiatric disease, I can say, well, let's see what happens if I put it into this in silico model and I try it out. How does it actually affect my reconstructed neurons? And then if it looks like it's going, maybe then we can try it on the animals in the laboratory. So those five little rats did not die in vain. My goal our goal, if I speak for everybody in my lab, I suppose, we want to use the tools of algebraic topology now in order to study this network, in order to be able to quantify somehow the structure and the function of this network in the same language. Now, you all, of course, know what topology is. It's somewhere between the A and the G in Siam AG. Some sort of <laughs> I think we have both algebra and geometry. Here we have algebra, geometry, and topology happily sitting between them. And so it's, it seems like we could hope. I mean, a lot of other, other kinds of mathematical tools, subdynamical systems, PDEs, uh, um, information theory, these have all been used in neuroscience. But maybe it's time to have some new mathematical tools. I'm going to say something about how we've used topology, but I, am, I strongly believe that many kinds of mathematics that are not currently used for neuroscience could be, and to great profit. So why algebraic topology, besides the fact that I'm an algebraic topologist? I have a beautiful hammer, and everything looks like a nail. <laughs> it's, it's deeper than that, truly. So math topology is the mathematics of shape, as you know. It's ideal for discussing connectivity, and it's beautifully designed for discussing, as is algebraic geometry, for studying problems of emergence of global structure from local constraints. What could be, more, what could be better in this context? Right? It's exactly the kind of thing we're looking for, connectivity and emergence of global structure from local constraints. Also, graph theory has been extensively used in neuroscience for the last uh, 10, 10, 12 years or so, and it's already proved extremely useful in analyzing what they call the connectome. So the word connectome as, as applied to the brain, either in terms of thinking of a network of brain regions or a network of neurons, was one of these terms that was invented roughly simultaneously in Lausanne, here in Switzerland, by Patrick Hagman, and in the US by Olaf Sporns. So the connectome meaning the network of neurons or a network of brain regions. So here we have a couple of neurons who are happily talking to each other. These blobby things are their cell bodies, their somas. And these lit up points here are supposed to illustrate uh, the synapses where information is being transmitted by neurotransmitters from the axon of one to the dendrite of the other. So the important thing to maintain here is that these are connections with direction. Remember, it's always flowing from the axon to the dendrite, like this. Think of the synapses sort of as valves, if we will. This is a slightly simplistic view of things. There is a certain amount of back propagation that happens and so on. But it's not, it's a reasonable approximation for now. So what we're going to do, as mathematicians, we need to find some representation of this network that we can actually work with where we can actually apply the tools of topology or graph theory or something. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at this thing as a directed graph and apply tools that are appropriate for that. So which kind of topological tools are we going to use for representation? Well, let me talk more generally 
about how you can go from thinking about networks of various kinds to topology. So you could think about directed or undirected networks, weighted or unweighted. There are various flavors you can have. You can have labels on the vertices. You can, but what you would like to do to analyze such things is a kind of a statistical point of view. You want to say, okay, what are the significant subnetworks or subgraphs in here? And I'd like to do some sort of analysis of the larger graph in terms of smaller pieces. This, again, is a very typical thing we do in mathematics. You break it up into pieces you can actually understand and analyze, and you see how those pieces fit together. And that's what we're going to do here. You want to choose what neuroscientists would call motifs, important subnetworks. And in order to be able to sort of fit this whole family together, I want my family of subnetworks I consider to be closed under vertex or node elimination. If I have my graph, I want uh, this one of these significant subnetworks, and I remove a node or remove a vertex, then I would like, and the, with the edges, of course, I would like the, the new graph to be also within that family. So then the numbers, so the statistic, statistical analysis you can do by counting how many of these different types of subnetwork you have within your graph, that gives you some local information about the network. And if you want global information, then what you're going to look at is how all these different subnetworks overlap. What do their intersections look like? How do they build more complex structures? And so that's, what that's the sort of general workflow, which can be applied with many different families of significant subnetworks. And I'm going to talk about the choice that we made in order to do this analysis. So I'm thinking about now directed, unweighted graphs. So that's the kind of representation we're using for our network. We could be thinking about it in terms of weights because the synapses actually are, have different weights in some sense. They're more reliable, stronger, whatever. But we're thinking about this, we're simplifying, we're just thinking about this as being directed. They're connected or they're not connected in a directed way. Okay, so the particular subnetworks, significant subnetworks we're going to think about, we're calling directed and simplices. So what these are is simply acyclic subgraphs on n plus 1's vertices that are also complete. So this is a clique on n plus 1 vertices that, once you take the directions on the edges into account, is acyclic. And the reason for doing this is that these things look like little feed-forward networks. So we're thinking about these as being significant subnetworks of neurons that are working together to funnel the information, to feed the information forward. Now, this is not the only choice one can make for subnetworks to focus on, but it turns out to be a useful one. So we could do it just with one vertex, that'd be a directed zero simplex, two vertices, directed one simplex, three vertices, a directed two simplex, and four vertices, a directed three simplex. And notice, for example, if we focus on this directed three simplex, built on four vertices, that if I eliminate any one of these nodes, then I'm just going to get a directed two simplex. This family really is closed under elimination of nodes like this. And you see that it really is feed forward. Every little subgraph like that has a unique source, a unique sink. Here we go, a unique source. Uni Where is it? There it is. It's a unique source, unique sink. And if I look at any face, again, it's always there's a unique source, unique sink. So these are complete acyclic subgraphs, which we think about, we focus on because of their feed forward nature. All right. So that was the sort of the local information. You would count how many of such things you had. If you want to see how it all fits together, then you're going to build what we call directed flag complex, which is a uh, generalization of or related to the usual notion of flag complex or clique complex that you have for an undirected graph. So we start with a digraph with set of vertices V, set of directed edges E. Then the directed flag complex is going to be an ordered simplicial complex, which is to say it's a collection of totally ordered sets, otherwise known as lists that's closed under taking sublists or taking subordered sets. The zero simplices here are V. Our n simplices are these directed n plus 1 clicks, these complete directed acyclic subgraphs on n plus 1 vertices. And these all fit together because every face of an n simplex, directed n simplex, is a directed n minus 1 simplex. And here's just this thing I said before, every subclick will also have a unique source, a unique sink, so we always have this well-defined sense of where the information is flowing. The idea is to think of these 
n sympathies, directed n sympathies for increasing n as increasing robust ways of transmitting information. If I go back just a second here, here, if I lose this connection, these two, this edge, these two are not disconnected now. If I lose one of the edges here, I'm still gonna have at least one path from the source to the sink. Here, this is even more robust. I can lose even more edges and still have at least one connection from source to sink. So they're increasingly robust feed-forward mechanisms. And we're gonna see how all of these things fit together. And this is captured by this global structure, which is the directed flag complex. So here's a little tiny example to illustrate the fact that we're also allowing ourselves to have reciprocal connections. So here is a little directed graph of the type that I can consider. So my graphs are all loop-free. There are no edges that go from a node to itself, which is, reflects biology. But you can have reciprocal connections. It's entirely possible to have a connection from neuron A to neuron B, and from neuron B to neuron A. And those both should be represented as reciprocal edges. So this is my directed graph. How am I getting a directed flag complex out of it? Well, here, for example, if I look at these three neurons, this forms one of these directed two simplices. This set of three neurons here does not. It's actually a cycle instead. This one does. However, if I go take the long way around like that, now it's a cycle. So the directed flag complex I get from this has two of these directed two simplices, and these guys remain there as cavities, as holes. So when I, it's, sometimes when I talk about this, people will say, well, why, you know, if you're, not, if you're focusing on these directed two simplices, then these cycles, you know, you're forgetting them. They're like, no, I'm not forgetting them. They're becoming even more important because now they're gonna show up and create classes in homology. And so somehow that sort of cyclic, cyclic structure, we see it in, we're sort of separating it from looking at the feed-forward structure. So more generally, we're interested in how and what sort of cavities show up in these flag complexes? Once you have a directed flag complex, you can also associate to it a topological space in the usual way one does a geometric realization of a simplicial complex. And you can look for cavities in these structures. That is to say, you're gonna calculate the homology and look for homology classes. So we can build cavities from one simplices in this way. You think of it like building a little window in your castle. Or you can build two-dimensional cavities by gluing together, for example, eight of these two simplices. And in this way, you can create homology classes in this structure. And these cavities, because they're now involving several of these elementary building blocks, which are these feed-forward networks, are sort of more global pieces of the structure. And going about and determining how many of these you have also is gonna give you a sense of how complex your structure is. Because here's an interesting exercise for you. Try to figure out, now this directed case, which is more tricky than the usual undirected case, think about how many, for example, five simplices, you need to build uh, an actual five cycle in this structure. It's pretty complex to do it, actually. Okay, so that's the sort of topological representation we're going to use, topological tools we're gonna to use to study this network. So what sort of insights do we get into the structure of the network with these particular topological tools? It gives us a way to quantify the complexity and the structural organization of the network. So if we look at this particular plot here, what I'm doing is on the x-axis, I have simplex dimension, directed simplex dimension, and on the y-axis, number of simplices, up to 80 million. Now, if you focus on the blue curve here, the blue curve is counting how many directed simplices of the different dimensions one has in the blue brain microcircuit. And so you see that there are something like 80 million two simplices, something like 70 million three simplices, still about uh, 10 million four simplices and so on. There's a change of scale which leads to this particular blowout here. Now we're looking at on the order of 10,000 and we see that there are still 4,000, roughly 4,000 six simplices and even some seven simplices, up to eight different neurons that are all to all connected in this directed manner. So just when we first showed this data to the neuroscientists, they were very surprised. They didn't expect at all that there would be sorry, quite so many really, oops, hello, quite so many really complex structures in this, uh, in this complex. So you need to compare, I mean, numbers in and of themselves don't mean anything. You have to compare them to something. So the comparison, the first comparison we did, which is a completely unfair comparison, 
was to say, okay, suppose you take an Ardish Renyi random graph with the same number of vertices, 31,000, the same number of edges, 8 million, and you know, you distribute them uh, randomly. What sort of structure do you get? Well, you compute again the directed flag complex, and you see that, well, of course, you have the same number of edges. You still have a, quite, a, quite a few two simplices, almost no three simplices, and after that, it's done. There are no four simplices, five simplices, and so on. It's structurally much less complex. There are no simplices of degree greater than three. So this is a relief to the Swiss government. They didn't spend 200 million francs on building a random graph. <laughs> but that's a completely unfair comparison. Nobody expected it to be a random graph. Or, or maybe, I, I don't know, maybe from somebody from Zurich, but nobody. <laughs> but um, that's an internal joke for the Swiss. <laughs> um, so we do more, a more fair comparison, which is to say, all right, let's look at, let's put some biology into our, into our random model. So we're just, we take, we don't take precise morphologies into account. We don't take precise connection probabilities into account. We just sort of, you know, approximate. That, and a lot of neuroscientists thought that should be good enough. That should give us as much information. And that's what these red and yellow curves here give us. And you see that, yeah, well, it's considerably more complex than Erdos Renyi, but um, there are many fewer simplices, and they die out in dimension five. So the blue brain structure is noticeably more complex than that. So once you did this, or you counted these simplices in this digital reconstruction, then you go back to the lab. So you can do an experiment which is called a patch clamp, where they take a slice of brain tissue and then stick electrodes, these glass electrodes, into the somas of up to 12 different neurons. And then you put current into one of these, and then see how it distributes throughout this network of 12. And you, in that way, you can deduce how they're connected with each other. These patch clamp experiments are difficult to do. They have to go take place in a room that's at 38 degrees Celsius. The brain tissue doesn't live for very long. It's, it's really complex. But there's a, a guy at EPFL, Rodrigo Perrin, who did 55 of these experiments for us. And he was just sampling up to 12 neurons. And he discovered quite a lot of two simplices, a fair number of three simplices, and even some four simplices. So by choosing 12 neurons at random, he was even able to find up to five of them that were all to all connected in this directed way. He then went back and did an in silico version of the same experiment and ended up with a distribution which is similar, but if anything, tells us that, in this case, we were able to do 100,000 experiments because it's on the computer. And if anything, it looks as if they were currently underestimating the actual topological complexity, if you will, of the networks of, of real, honest biological neurons. And that once, this, uh, once they've improved the digital reconstruction of the microcircuit, we're probably going to get even more complexity. Now, I've tried to wave my hands and argue that these directed simplicities are something worth studying, but this is actually confirmed by the following study. So what we did here was to say, I'm going to look at a connection in the graph, an edge of the graph, and say, what is the highest dimensional simplex to which this edge belongs? So that's what we're measuring here along the x-axis. When it says dimension, that's the, highest, the maximal dimension of a simplex to which the edge belongs. What we're plotting on the y-axis sorry, is the correlation in firing patterns. So we have two neurons that are connected as an edge, and you observe how they fire. So you get a time series of what they call the, what we call spike trains, so these time series of spiking patterns. And you can do a correlation, a Pearson correlation in this case, between their spiking behavior. And you say, okay, how, do, how correlated are they? So this uh, black dotted line is the average correlation of all connected pairs. So it's about 0.3. What we see here, if we focus, for example, on the blue, where we're looking at all possible connections, is that as dimension increases, the correlation also increases. So this is an indication that being part of a more and more bigger structure, like this bigger feedforward structure, means that the electrical behavior is becoming more and more coherent. Not only that, there's also a dependency on where exactly in the simplex the connection is. The red curve is telling us about the connections within the simplex from the neuron just before the sink to the sink itself. So these are the guys that have the most common input, and they are, in fact, more correlated than anybody else and also increasingly highly correlated. Another interesting message to take from this is when you look at this end of the graph, 
if you're thinking about what does it mean for the maximal dimension of a simplex to which an edge belongs to be one? It means that that edge lives all by itself. It's not part of any other bigger structure. And it turns out that if that's the case, then the correlation in electrical behavior between the neurons, even though they're connected, is still half of what it is globally throughout the network. So you really have to be part of something bigger in order to have correlated electrical behavior. So this is, this is pretty convincing, I think. This one sort of is to emphasize the point by saying, not only does correlation increase with the dimension of simplex, it increases with the number of such simplex, simplices to which you belong. That's what we're plotting on the x-axis here for the various dimensions, is how many simplices of the various dimensions you belong to, and what happens to correlation. And you see that as the number of, for example, four simplices to which an edge belongs increases, the correlation also increases. But not only that, if you compare the case of four-dimensional to five-dimensional, you need fewer <coughs> five-dimensional simplices to belong to fewer five-dimensional simplices to attain the same level of correlation than in the case of four-dimensional simplices. So this is, you know, saying, okay, maybe we're on the right track by having focused on these particular <coughs> significant subnetworks or motifs. We also did a validation on a very simple animal, a nematode, C. elegans, that has, you know, on the order of 300 neurons. Very, very simple, doesn't have much of a life, but it um, does have, the, one, one great advantage to C. elegans is that we know exactly how all of its neurons are connected to each other. We know this directed graph in this case, and you can do the same sort of thing. You can count, okay, it gives me a directed graph, I can calculate directed flag complex, I can look at the numbers of simplices, and I can compute the Betty numbers as well. And I see that I have up to seven dimensional simplices even in C. elegans, and it even has seven dimensional homology. So that's a really complex structure. And they did, again, did the comparison with Ardish Reni random graphs with the same number of edges and the same number of vertices. And you see that, you know, the number of simplex, the, sorry, simplex dimension dies out in three and homology dies out in two. So it is really much, much more complex than you would get from a random graph even in the case of simple C. elegans. And I just heard the other day in one of the lectures in my mini symposium they organized that uh, Diane Goetz has recently shown that actually this is a, a very large wedge of spheres in this case, this uh, directed flight complex. Okay. This is one thing that I think is fairly remarkable. So remember, this all started with five little rats that gave us five sets of input parameters to this network, and they made seven different instantiations, so seven different microcircuits for each rat. And you could say, well, do, are they topologically similar to each other, the seven different instantiations for the same rat? And if I have two different rats, and I look at the different microcircuits for the two different rats, are they actually, can we actually distinguish them from each other? Well, it turns out the topology does actually allow us to do this. So here we're plotting Betty 2, the number of two cavities, against Betty 3. And this is the color coded for the five different rats, and then in blue we have the average one as well. And so what we see is that, indeed, if we have two instantiations of the, this for the same set of parameters, so this is in color there, and we plot Betty 2 versus Betty 3, we get very similar values, and that it separates beautifully the different rats. So this is, uh, an this is showing that topology really is picking up something important about biology because the only difference here is really in terms of these biological input parameters to this algorithm. Okay. So what can you say about function? Because we're really interested in how things actually work. What happens with, uh, during activity? Can we use the same kind of language in order to study activity in this network? So. Here we're seeing what happens when sort of this virtual slice of brain tissue is reacting to an input stimulus. It's a beautiful pattern with the spreading of the electrical signal across there, sort of this magical tapestry of signal. And you say, well, that's, you know, it's gorgeous, but is there some way we can actually quantify what's going on? And is there any way we can see the, the topology, sort of the, the topology of the structure shaping what's going on in the activity? This was the hope that we would be able to do this. So what we did, we said, well, di directed graphs work well for understanding structure. Let's try directed graphs as well for understanding activity. 
So we want to somehow use directed graphs to code activity in the network. So the idea is the following. You look at either some spontaneous activity or some stimulated activity, evoked activity in the network, and then you say, okay, I'm going to make time bins, break this up into snapshots of activity, and each particular time bin, I'm going to say what, what subgraph of the microcircuit was actually active at that time. And what you get, therefore, is a time series of subgraphs of your original directed graph of the microcircuit. And what you want to do, then, is to see how those graphs change through time. So the way we determine what we could actually consider to be the active subgraph at any time, we had to come up with some sort of proxy for causality, like is this neuron causing this one to fire? This is a really hard question, well, it's an easy question to ask, it's a very hard question to answer because it's a, a very, very complex problem. So we came up after so with some uh, probabilistic analysis with what we call the transmission response rule. So here we're considering only subgraphs of our original graph. So we will consider an edge to be active. It has to already be there as a structural connection. But then you have to say, all right, um, when are we going to consider an edge to be active? You say, if there was a structural connection, if the presynaptic neuron fires within that time bin, and the postsynaptic one at most 10 milliseconds afterwards. So what you get is a picture like this. So here, on this side, we see sort of the whole microcircuit in one of these snapshots where these yellow lines indicate like an active connection. So here we're looking at just a zooming into layer five. So we see some neurons that are just little white points there. They are not connected to anything else, so they weren't active at the time. And otherwise, we have these active edges. So we set up a simulation with nine different input stimuli and then studied what happened over 30 different trials. So here we have 30 different trials in each case. We have here are five different neurons we're looking at, how they're spiking through time. On this axis, we have time. On this axis, we have the trials. And the little black dots, this is what's called a raster plot. We're seeing where the neurons are firing. And they studied these firing patterns for the different neurons and then applied this transmission response rule to see which simplices were active. We get then time series of different invariants, numbers of edges, Betty 1, Betty 3, the Euler characteristic, for these nine different stimuli that we were studying. So we get time series of these topological invariants coming from the time series of subgraphs. And then we can quantify activity. So we end up with some sort of topological signature of information processing. What this picture is telling us is the following. Time is moving along in this direction. We're looking at three different stimuli here, from highly synchronous to not so synchronous. And what you see is that as, as time passes, you have increasingly complex structure that's developing. So you're adding more and more edges. You're creating more and more Betty 1, more and more 1 cycles. And then just as that, you, you're gathering more and more edges. Some of, those, some of those loops start filling in. And you start building some three-dimensional homology classes until you reach a sort of a culminating point, the most complex structure, where the information processing has reached its point. And then everything collapses. And you see that the, what's interesting here is you have the same kind of signature, roughly the same kind of shape, for three different stimuli. We also get it for the five different rats with the same stimulus. You get the same kind of pattern each time. And this is just showing us where the activity is in the circuit as this goes around. So the, the color coding here, the heat map, is showing where the activity is in the circuit. So topology gives us this beautiful signature of information processing. We can do the same sort of analysis by looking at not just actual spiking, but how voltage is moving through this uh, network, doing an in silico version of what's called uh, voltage-sensitive dye dynamics, where, which is something where the, the neuroscientists, they inject dye into the brain of a living animal, and then as the animal is interacting with the environment, the voltage of different parts of the brain changes, and you can see this sort of lighting up the different degrees of luminescence. And so you can analyze this in a similar way, and you end up again with a dependency of the correlation in the VS in this voltage dynamics, depending on dimension. And you also get these kind of swoosh type behaviors that for the voltage, as well as we had for the spiking, also plotting against Betty, Betty numbers against each other. A couple more topological adventures to mention just in passing. As I said, you can take the weights of the synapses into account, and these weights change as the, as the circuit is learning. This is called plasticity. 
So you're looking at a weighted die graph. And so you bring in the tools of persistent homology, topological data analysis, and you can establish structural property, structure property relationships based on persistent homology. We've needed to develop new mathematical tools. Somebody told me at our first symposium, ah, but it doesn't seem like you're doing much deep mathematics. True enough so far. But we had to develop new tools, new mathematics, to take direction into account so that we can pick up something about the dynamics of the network and not just uh, topological structure. We could also use topological data analysis to analyze network dynamics. It turned out very well. And we could use topology as well to classify neuron morphologies. And then this led us to be able to synthesize new models of uh, neurons that have, even have correct electrical behavior. So this movie, little movie here is just showing how this synthesis of neurons works. This is entirely based on topology to come up with actually very highly morphologically correct models of neurons just using a topological data analysis of known morphology. No project like this would be possible without a long list of collaborators with a wide list of uh, backgrounds, everything from pure algebraic topology to neuroscience to computer science and uh, beyond. And so I'd like, it's a pleasure for me to recognize all of them, in particular the ones who do the visualizations for us, and to thank you very much for your attention and point out that the Blue Brain is currently hiring postdocs. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Uh, questions? I like to throw this thing. Uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, so there is a recent paper suggesting that um, the glia cell that was believed to function only as a support on nutrition to the neural cell actually plays a significant role in the regulation of the neural, net, neural networks. So do you think there is a way to put in the function of glia cell into your model and how that can change the results of your analysis? So, that's an excellent question. This is, this is work in progress. Okay. So they are currently integrating astrocytes into the, into the model as well as the vasculature. There was no vasculature there yet, no blood flow. So they're going to build in the astrocytes and the vasculature, and then later down the road, the oligodendrocytes and the macroglia as well. Okay. okay. Yeah, and it will definitely have an effect on the function. Okay, thank you. Team. There are many different ideas of directed homology. Have you seen certain ones that are more beneficial for analyzing the microcircuits? So we looked at, so most of the notions of directed homology are coming from um, people who've done uh, computer science, uh, concurrency and things like that. And the models that they had were either too hard actually to compute because we really need to compute things and not just have pretty, you know, beautiful theorems. Um, or they were orientation invariant. And if you change the orientation of a particular directed graph, you change its dynamics a lot. So it wasn't something that was useful for us. This is why we've had to develop new techniques for analyzing these networks to be able to take into account the dynamics as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Others? That's maybe, fine. maybe back there. Let's work from the back. Uh, so if you wanted to do something uh, sort of inverse to this, like reconstruct uh, the detailed structure of the network from activity, what sort of topological tools would you bring to bear there? So that's another very good question. So that's part of what, there was one slide that went really fast at the end when I was talking about dynamics and networks. So what people usually have when, they're, when they get data from a lab, they don't know the actual connections. Because in order to get the actual connections, then you have to I mean, use an electron micrograph and it's a huge terabytes of data and, and then you don't have activity, obviously, because the thing is not alive when it's under the electron microscope. Um, 
so usually people have to sort of figure out what the connectivity is and they have to try to deduce the connectivity from activity. And so this is the, the it's, a, it's a different kind of problem. One can use the, tech, the tools of topological data analysis to attack this, for example, by looking at different notions of spike correlation. But um, one thing I, I would like to do that we haven't been able to do so far because at first the computational tools were not sufficiently powerful was to say, okay, we actually know the ground truth in the microcircuit. And to say, let's stimulate it, let's look at its activity and forget, pretend, we, uh, pretend we don't know the ground truth and see if we can deduce the ground truth from the activity. And we talked about doing this a few years ago and it turned out that the, the computationally it was out of reach. Mm -hmm. But maybe tools have gotten much better so maybe we can actually try to, try to do this to see whether the techniques people propose now for doing this actually work. Okay, we do two more. Amber? Okay. <laughs> Let's try this. <laughs> All right. All right. So you had a... A picture of neural activity increasing, reaching a climax, and then collapsing. Yep. And you had uh, the pictures of the regions of uh, what was highlighted. Yep. And so there, when the signal reached its climax, it seemed that only the fifth region, or so only the middle region, was um, active. Yeah. So is there, um, I mean, are all these inhibitor cells in the middle layer, or is there a topological reason why? It's so I think there's a biological reason, which is that that's kind of, those are kind of the output layers. So at the end of this sort of information processing, you need to do something about it, which is to send the signal further. And I think that that's probably the explanation for why that's where the activity ends at the end of this process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and Sandra, the last. So I was wondering if uh, in all these years of, study, of studies, if you have encountered some algebraic structure, some polynomials or something appearing <laughs> here and there. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure there are some. <laughs> uh, so, I'm not trained to look for them. Okay. So, I think that, I think that this, this is why, this is why I hope more people will join me in exploring neuroscience because I think, I mean, I don't, I, there's a lot, I know a very, very small part of mathematics, and I think lots of other parts of mathematics that can be extremely useful in this context. Now, I think that in some sense, yes, in terms of algebraic structure, um, so, you know, we have a complex. So far, we've calculated Betty numbers. This is really, like, really low-level stuff, right? Um, I think, I'm convinced that if, let's say we look at the cohomology and we start thinking about what is the, what is the cup product structure on the cohomology? What are the indecomposables for the cup product structure on the cohomology? I'm sure that there's important meaning there in this cup product structure. And I think that this is not so far out of reach. It's, it's, tech, it's uh, computationally challenging, figuring out how do you choose representatives for cohomology classes and so on. I think we're going to get there, and I think this is going to contain interesting information. So this is, we're going to get beyond Betty numbers. I hope in a few years we'll be up on that. Okay. On that note, thank you very, very much for a fantastic talk. <laughs> and with this, I'm passing it on to the hero of the week. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having been here. Um, to uh, paraphrase our speaker, no conference like this would have been possible without many people helping out here, and I'd like to call your attention to 16 of them. Please come in. Some of them are outside. Please come in. So, So these, these are the people that have made this week run so smoothly. I'd like to call your attention to two people in particular, namely Cheyenne, who is on this side over here, and Patrick, who is on the far uh, right for you. They have helped me for the last four or five months for, in preparing this conference. So thank you, everyone, and thanks especially to these people. Now, 
Before you run away, there was one more conference announcement that Saf would like to make. Is Saf still there? Should I throw this to you? <laughs> I should have practiced this more. So, hi everybody. Uh, mathematical aspects of computer information science is uh, uh, organized every two years, and this year it will be in Istanbul. Uh, it's the eighth iteration. Uh, the topics are, there's a large overlap with uh, the audience here. A lot of people who are here are also involved uh, in uh, this year's organization. Uh, and uh, but we don't have the slide. Yeah, it's anyway, still, it's okay. It's coming, something is happening. Maybe. And it will take place uh, in Istanbul, in Gebze Technical University. It's uh, very easy to reach from uh, most places in the world. Uh, I mean, Istanbul, at least. <laughs> and uh, the university has a uh, light rail, uh, light rail train uh, stop. Yeah. So as you see, uh, so the invited speakers are Matt Beck, uh, Georg Fussbauer, and Agnes Santo. And uh, the topics are so we have four main tracks on algorithms and foundations, security, cryptography, all kinds of combinatorics, codes, graphs, data modeling, and machine learning. And there will be two special sessions on software and tools and an early stage uh, researcher forum this year. So you can see the link for more information. And it will be November 13 to 15, 2019 in Gebze. Hope to see you there. Thank you.